We're running behind schedule. We've had some problems with our uh, live broadcast. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Ra Rachel. Um, Rachel's with Woodford Cedar Web. And with that, I'm going to send it over to you, Rachel. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Joel. Uh, my name is Rachel Detto. I am here from Woodford Cedar Run Wildlife Refuge, and I am um, an educator here. Um, Woodford Cedar Run Wildlife Refuge, if you know us, you probably know us because of our wildlife hospital. If you don't know us, um, we do have about 171 acres that's set aside for um, animals. It is protected property. Um, it's set aside for animals. We do allow hiking on it. Um, we do allow um, just general light use type stuff. We don't allow like hiking or anything like that. Um, but we do have um, 171 acres set aside. We do have a small lake and we also have uh, the unique distinction of having a wildlife hospital on our property, which is how many people know us. So the wildlife hospital is going to take in animals from all across the entire state of New Jersey, ones that are sick or injured or uh, orphaned in some way, and we will rehabilitate them. We'll heal them and we'll put them back out in the wild because they don't wanna live with us. Now, we have so far broken our record from last year. We have seen over 5,500 animals this year, and we still have mm, November and December to go. So we have already broken our record for the number of animals seen this year, which is amazing. Um, we do try and put as many animals back out in the wild as we can. Now, that doesn't mean that we can do all of them because sometimes they're injured in a way that doesn't allow them to survive on their own. So the ones that we, we actually do have a um, wildlife housing area. So we do have some animals that cannot be released back into the wild. Um, if you come and visit us, you are able to see most of them. Um, the ones that I have here today, uh, because I do have some live animals to show you because what would be the fun of telling you about the animals if I couldn't show you them, show them to you. Um, we do have some live animals here, ones that cannot be released. Um, one of them you will not be able to see unless you come to a program with us. The other ones you can sometimes see, but they like to hide. And they like to hide mostly because they are nocturnal animals. So they are animals that pretty much only come out at night. Now, um, I'm going to start with the lower end of the food chain. So um, when we talk about food chains and food webs, we try and say that they are more of a food web because animals don't necessarily just eat one thing, but they sometimes eat a variety of different things. So um, the animal that's lower on the food, way, uh, the food web is... Um, a little bit further down might be eaten by both of my other animals, um, but he's actually still a predator. So we're gonna get to him first. We're gonna start small and go bigger as we go. Okay. Now, my first animal is, well, a little bit creepy crawly because some people tend not to like these guys, but I love them. He's really, really cute and you'll see that too. But if I hear any screams coming from the screen, well, sorry guys. <laughs> um, he is, let's see, let me see if I can get him out. Hi, um, sweetheart. Oh, come here. Oh, you're being so cute. So, oh, there's his face. This is Chevy. Chevy is our corn snake, one of our corn snakes. Okay. Now, Chevy is, um, he was somebody's pet, so he cannot be released back out in the wild. He actually has no fear of people anymore, which is not something that you want in a wild animal, right? You don't want them to um, go up to somebody and just, you know, look for food or something like that, okay? So Chevy is... Um, he is a corn snake and corn snakes are endangered in the state of New Jersey and they are um, kind of hard to find anymore. They do live in the Pine Barrens, um, but they are harder to find partially because, again, they're nocturnal animals. So they're trying to find their food at night when we are out during the day when we're you know, trying to do other things. Right? Now, Chevy does have a bunch of unique characteristics that help him 
find food because he is a predator. Even though he is lower on the food web, he is a predator. So he is going to be eating other things. Now, this little guy mostly is going to be eating things like rodents. So um, small mice, moles, moles, chipmunks, um, maybe some small amphibians like frogs and toads. He might also try and do salamanders if he can find them or insects when they're little because when they're born, they're only about the size of a pencil, okay? So when they're born, when they're little, they're probably gonna eat like crickets and grasshoppers and things like that. Things even lower on the food chain than they are, okay? Now, this guy, he is a predator, okay? Now, the other thing that he's going to be eating too, and um, where some people are kind of surprised to find them is actually on tree branches. They actually do like to climb trees. You see, he's doing a pretty good job climbing on me. He thinks that I'm just a pretty warm tree branch. Um, he does have his back anchored right here. So he's wrapped around me pretty tightly. Okay. These guys are mostly muscle. Um, a lot of people think snakes are slimy or they're squishy or something like that. But this guy is actually mostly muscle. So he is actually very, very strong. He's able to wrap around and he's able to grab onto things very, very easily. Now, the other cool thing is that in order to help climb trees, he is actually going to use his scales, use his belly scales to help him. So he does have his muscles to kind of scoot around. You can see he's got this sort of S shape going on. That's not just because I'm holding him, that's because he can push off that way. Okay. But his scales will also help him out. I can move him a little bit closer to the camera. You can see his um, side scales are there for protection. And then his belly scales are a little bit longer. They're a little wider. Oh, he's investigating the camera. <laughs> so his belly scales are a little bit wider and a little bit longer. And they can actually be um, moved a little bit. So they'll, he'll use them to scooch forward and to grab on, um, mostly to the tree bark. So when he's climbing, um, he can grip onto that. Now he also uses, like I said, his muscles to try and weave up the side of the tree, which is really, really cool. Now, the whole reason that they go up the tree is because of one of the other things that they love to eat. Now, these guys, in addition to rodents and small mammals, these guys also like to eat birds. So they will climb up on, climb up in the tree, invade nests all the time. So they will go in after the eggs and after the hatchlings. Um, so if you have these guys, you probably have a great ecosystem around to support them. They are kind of generalists, so they'll eat just about anything that can fit in their mouth, which is great for them. The problem with these guys and the reason they're endangered in the state of New Jersey, especially around here, is probably is due to habitat loss. Not probably, it is due to habitat loss. Um, partially it's because the people see snakes and they think, oh my gosh, the snakes are going to hurt me. Not the case, these guys are really, really docile. They're very gentle. Um, and they come out at night when most people are not around, they're not out, okay? But mostly it's habitat loss. So they're, people don't realize that they're in that area, that they're in the area that they are in and they build and they will um, destroy their hunting grounds or destroy um, their habitat, destroy the, um, the places that they like to hibernate. Okay, especially this time of year. If you see a snake this time of year, um, they are cold-blooded, which means that they don't make their own heat. They are reliant on the outside temperature to um, keep themselves active. So this time of year, a lot of these snakes are going to be moving to a hibernaculum. So they're going to be moving to a place that they can hibernate and stay safe all winter long. Now, these guys are, whoops. Come back here. <laughs> they may uh, hibernate in a couple of times. Different snakes will do different amounts. Um, but what they're going to do is they're actually going to follow a scent trail um, to move to a nice, safe place. It might be under a big log. It might be under the ground entirely. It might be under a huge rock in a crevice. Some place where they will be safe for the whole winter long because once their temperature gets down low enough, they won't be able to react to a predator coming after them, okay? So they wouldn't be able to react to something coming after them, even if they wanted to. And I did say they're following their scent trails. 
And that's actually one of their main senses. You can see when he's looking around, he's not really seeing things too, too well. He does have decent eyesight, it's probably comparable to ours, but his main, um, his main way of getting information about the world is actually going to be his little tongue, okay? That little tongue acts just like our nose. So our nose is what picks up chemical molecules out of the air and is able to translate them, you know, move them to an area where our brain can translate them. The organ that does that for him is his tongue. So he is going to take, use that little snaky tongue, okay? And he is going to, let's see if I'll investigate the camera again. Let me see that. <laughs> he is going to use that tongue to pick up scent molecules out of the air and put them into something called the Jacobson's organ, the roof of his mouth. And that is able to translate to something that tells him whether there's food around or whether there's predators around or something that he doesn't know. Now, the reason his tongue is forked, his tongue actually has two parts to it. Okay? And that is able to help him tell which direction the scent is coming from. So whether it's something that is going to hurt him, so if it's a predator hanging around, um, he knows to move away from that side. Okay? If it is a prey animal, obviously he's gonna try and move towards it. Now, the reason that makes a difference is because like I said, he is a prey animal as well. So he is going to be eaten by other animals. He wants to give his position away as little as possible. Now he does have this fantastic camouflage on him and the, um, corn snakes are known for their coloring, but that only works if he stays still, okay? So if he stays still and just uses his little tongue, flicking it out to see what's around or to smell what's around, then he's gonna be a lot safer than if he moved his head all around. Now, like I said, he is very, very used to being handled. He's very used to being held. He doesn't think he's in any danger right now. And he's just trying to investigate. What he is trying to do, though, is he is trying to get back into his little pillowcase, which is a nice, nice dark, comfy cave for him. Okay. Now, most snakes um, in this area are actually going to be nocturnal. It's a little bit safer for them. And there's a lot more mice around. So they can come out at night when their food is out. Now, there are other things that are going to eat him. There's a number of different things that are going to eat him, okay? And I'm going to get into that with my next animal. So let me see if I can find... No, you cannot go in my shirt. Stop that. Thank you. Come on. Go back on the pillowcase. He's a sweetheart. I love him. <laughs> now, I did say the Chevy was a pet, and the reason his name is Chevy is because he was found in a car. So, yeah... Oh, I need my arm back. Thank you. There you go. All the way in. I'm going to be an ornery right now. Mm. Wrap him up really, really tight. He's not the one that tries to escape, but you never know. And we don't want to lose any of our animals. Like I said, they would not survive out in the wild. So if we lost them, that's kind of a death sentence for them. We don't want that to happen. So... Back in you go. There. And then just really, really quickly, I want to show you something that's really, really cool too. This is not from Chevy. This is from a different snake. But snakes will shed their skin. They do shed their um, uh, the skin over top of their shell, over top of their scales. Sorry. This one is from another snake that we have called a pine snake. And pine snakes are they're rare in New Jersey, but they are more abundant in the pine. Land. And so this guy is just, I just want to show you the length of this guy. But this is our pine snake, Warren. Um, he's very long. So if you see one of these guys, you are very, very lucky. He's probably about six feet long right now. Um, Chevy, he's about as big as a pine or a corn snake can get. They can get to be about five feet long. Um, pine snakes. Six maybe pushing seven feet, but for the most part, six feet long. Okay. Now this shed, even this shed is going to get eaten by other animals too. Okay. So um, raccoons love this kind of thing. Um, other animals might chow down on it. They probably won't live in it, but bugs will certainly go for it too. Um, and this leaves behind a scent trail. So other animals can find that as well. 
Which brings me to my other animal. My other animal I need big gloves for. Okay. You might have seen my next animal on some of our uh, media hanging around. Let's see if she'll cooperate. Now, I need to get her treats ready because if I don't have treats, she's just going to roam everywhere. So, you need to get some of these ready. Okay. Oh, are you ready to come out? Are you so curious? I think you are. Oh, but you don't like the gloves. I know, I'm sorry. Oh boy, come on now. So one animal that might eat or harass my little corn snake is this girl. This is Phoebe. Phoebe is an Eastern striped skunk. Um, she is, she was somebody's pet and unfortunately for her, she was descented. Now that means that she doesn't have her scent glands anymore. So what that makes her is defenseless out in the wild. So she cannot be released because of that. Plus, because she was somebody's pet, she is very, very used to people. Now, most skunks don't have too big of a fear of people to begin with because, well, people see a skunk and they say, uh, no, uh, I'm not, not messing with that, with good reason, okay? But this one is a little bit more overconfident than most, okay? Um, she also probably wouldn't be able to find food for herself out in the wild. Now, she probably would eat a snake if she had the opportunity, but for the most part, these guys are going to be eating bugs. Oh, come here, you. She's going to be wiggling around a lot. Let's see how this works, okay? I want you to take a look at her claws. And take a look as she investigates the camera. Okay. Notice that she is doing pretty much the same thing that the snake was. Most animals that come out at night are not going to have a great eyesight. They are going to have a great sense of smell, though, because that doesn't change depending on the light situation. Okay, so for skunks, their best sense is their sense of smell. Okay, her hearing is also pretty good. Her eyesight is not that great. Okay, she can still see, but not that all that, not all that well. So what she's going to do is she's going to use her little nose um, to sniff out lots of bugs, and she's going to use her ears to listen for bugs around, crawling around in the dirt. She's gonna use those huge, huge claws. Look at how big those claws are compared to the size of her head. Her, her claws are huge. Those huge claws are going to be there to dig in the ground, okay? Mostly for um, actually wasps and bees, um, ground hornets, things like that. She loves those kinds of things. Um, what else? Uh, termites all sorts of bugs like that, okay? Now, I have a bit of an apple in here, so maybe she'll be occupied by that. <laughs> uh, so what she's going to do is she is going to dig and dig and dig, and maybe she'll do it if I stop moving. Let's see. Oh, come here. Try and get the apple, okay? If she's interested in it. She's going to dig. Oh, she got it. <laughs> she's going to use... I hope you guys can hear that because that's kind of cool. Okay. She is going to use those sharp teeth and those claws to dig in and try and get whatever is inside there. Okay. Now, if she happens to turn up something like a salamander or a frog, she's definitely going to eat that too. These guys are omnivores. They are eating whatever they can find. Now, Chevy, he is a carnivore. Okay. He is going to be eating pretty much just meat, but that still puts him kind of low on the food chain because he's a little bit small. Okay. Um, let's see if I can angle this down a little bit. Get a better look at her. Okay. She's getting to the rest of it. Don't eat the snake skin. Don't eat the snake skin. Okay. If you have ever worked with animals, 
Come here. You should know that they are unpredictable. They don't always do what you need them to do. Okay. <laughs> no, you stop that. So um, the other really, really cool thing about these guys, because they are nocturnal animals, um, and because they have their smell to protect them, these guys are kind of cocky. Like they're, they've got some attitude to them. They're not scared of much of anything. So what they end up doing is they just sort of walk around. They use that big, bright white and black stripe as a warning for animals to not mess with them. Okay? Most animals are going to see that big, bright white and black stripe and say, no, no, I don't want to deal with that, okay? which is probably an appropriate reaction. Come here. Don't try and get the tooth. Let her down there. Okay. There we go. There you go. Not this one. Yes, you do. Okay. Now she can use her hands a little bit to hold things, and she is not above grabbing on to something like a snake and eating that. Okay. I don't imagine she would eat something like a mouse, but I've never put one in front of her either, so I'm not sure. Okay. I would not put it past her because, like I said, these guys are omnivores. They're also going to eat whatever they can. Okay, that's part of the reason that they're so abundant everywhere. Um, so these guys are great for that. Okay, now before she runs away too, too much, oh, she is kind of big too. Oh, she's going to feel it. Okay, she is pretty big. She actually weighs uh, probably about 15 pounds or so. So she's about as heavy as a big cat. She sort of acts like one. She does have that long, luxurious tail. Now, most people are going to ask about the scent, too. They do have scent glands that do make the smell. She is descented because she was somebody's pet. Now, we do not endorse that at all. Um, the, she came to us at the age of four months old when she was about the size of a shoe. She was little. And at the age of four months, she was uh, digging into the floorboards she was trying to get into the walls, trying to get into the refrigerator, and terrorizing the dogs. Okay, so all things you do not really want in a pet, besides being a nocturnal animal, which means that she's active when most other people are asleep, most other animals are asleep. Um, all that makes for a horrible, horrible house pet. Okay, now she's also pretty smart, which makes sense because she would have to try and find all of her prey, okay? She would have to try and find the prey. Yes, I know, come on, up here, up here. Move your face up, okay? Did you not want the apple? Okay, all right, I'm gonna put you away since you are wiggly. Don't worry, I will give her all of her treats. Come on, thank you. There's really only so long we can hold her before she gets uh, too wiggly and too curious and she just wants to run around or go back and roll and hide and sleep, which makes sense because, hey, nocturnal animal, right? Okay, there you go. Let me give you your treats too. Go on in. Go on. All the way in. All the way in. Or moderately good. We'll call that good. All right. So, surprisingly, most people would think that skunks do not have very many natural predators. Okay. Right? And you're right. Skunks do not have very many, very many natural predators. They do have some. Okay. Now, skunks usually don't have predators because of their smell. Because there's not a whole lot of things that can take that acrid, just if you've ever had your dogs skunked or anything like that is been in the vicinity of a skunk that has sprayed recently, it sticks to you. It's, it's bad, it stays with you, and it, they go for the eyes a lot of times. They, um, they just don't stop with it, right? So, Surprisingly, 
there are animals that will eat skunks that see that big, bright white and black stripe and say, yeah, that's lunch. I'd like to have some of that. My next animal is the one that does. They're primary predators, okay? The pinnacle of predatorial evolution in this area, really. Okay. I need the other big blood for this guy. Now let's see if he cooperates. I can't guarantee it, honestly, because again, we're working with animals and they don't always um, want to work, which I understand, but I really want to show them to you. So fingers crossed he'll come out well. Fingers crossed. The screen might shake a little. We'll see. Oh my goodness, I hear you. Oh, you had so much time to yourself in here, ready? Come on, step up. Oh, good boy. Ready? Another one. Come on. Step up. Step up. Come on. Step up. Come on. You're almost there. Step up. Come on. No. Oh, good boy. Good job. Good boy, Drew. Now he might try and fly off my glove. Hey, let me stop that. He's not too keen on all the bright lights. No. You good? Okay, he's good now. <laughs> so this is Houdini, okay? Now, Houdini is a great horned owl. And this is one of the very few predators, active predators of the skunks, okay? These guys, like I said, top of the predatory food chain around here. There's not many things that are gonna go after a great horned owl. They are big, they are powerful, they are nocturnal, and they are always on alert. Okay. So this guy has fantastic eyesight. They can see so well in the dark. Their eyes are huge. Their ears are amazing. Their hearing is fantastic. Their sense of smell though is practically non-existent. So the skunk's main defense is nothing to this guy. He, he doesn't care. He can't smell it, doesn't know that it stinks bad. When we get them into the hospital, if we get a great horned owl that smells like skunk, we know that they've actually been a successful hunter because they managed to get that, okay? Now, you saw that that skunk is huge, okay? That skunk is, what did I say, 15 pounds or more, okay? Big skunk, okay? In order to help grab that big skunk and not carry it away because big animal. Um, they've got these fantastically strong talons and these are the reasons that I have the big thick glove. The average adult human um, male can squeeze their fist about a hundred pounds per square inch. Okay, That's pretty strong. Like I, I can do like maybe 20. Like I'm, I'm weak. My, my fists are weak. An average adult male can do about 100 pounds per square inch. This guy can't, can't reliably measure it, but somewhere between four and 500 pounds per square inch. Okay, so between four and five times the grip strength of an adult human male. Okay, all focused in on these needle sharp points. Okay. So these needle sharp points are great for grabbing into something that large and squeezing it, okay? After that, it would hold it down with those. It would use their beak to carve it up and swallow chunks and bite-sized chunks, okay? It doesn't mean that's all they're going to eat. Great horned owls are also kind of generalists. They will eat whatever they can get, whatever happens to be out at night, okay? That includes squirrels and rabbits. That includes little things like mice, um, rats, snakes, if they happen to be out, okay? So Chevy, my poor snake, he could also fall prey to something like a great horned owl if they were hungry enough and if they were fast enough, okay? 
The thing with owls, for the most part, they are silent hunters. They rely on being quiet. That means that they're not quite as fast as some other birds of prey. So they're not as fast as the peregrine, certainly. But they're not even as fast as a hawk. Okay? A lot of times their wings are designed for... Hey, focus over here, please. Thank you. Their wings are designed for um, quietly drifting in okay, before their prey knows that they're there. Okay? Now, I did mention their big eyesight, their big eyes, and that's one of the ways that they find their prey. First, they listen for it, and then they spot it with their eyes. Their eyesight is fantastic. And you can see when they know they're looking at the camera, they're actually, you know that they're looking at you, okay? And their eyes are so large inside of their head that if our eyes were the same size comparatively, you know, eyeball size to skull size, our eyes would be the size of grapefruits, okay? Our eyes would be absolutely huge, okay? Now, his eyes are also not quite round. They're not quite balls. So their eyes are actually a little longer than they are wide, okay? That means that he has like a tube-shaped eye. Not very much, but enough. And what that means is that it allows more light to come in. He can pack more rods and cones in there, more rods and cones because Cones see color, rods see movement, and they see well in low light situations. Okay. So he has more rods than cones. Can you stop that, please? You okay? Okay. <laughs> he's seeing things out the window. I've got like two big windows out here. So he's seeing things out the window and thinking that he can go through. Still a wild animal, guys. They don't ever really get used to captivity. First chance they get, they will try and leave. So that's the thing. Unfortunately for him, um, he was a fledgling when he was found. Um, he did have a wing injury. Um, owls fledge in, I want to say like April, like March. Mm, they hatch in March, so April, May. Um, the problem is that they learn to fly by pretty much just jumping out of a tree and trying to fly. Sometimes that does mean that they get hurt on the way down. So he did have a broken wing when he was found. That wing wasn't able to be healed properly. So he can't fly well enough to hunt for himself, but he thinks he can, which is why he still tries to get away. Okay. Um, oh, so I was talking about his eyes. So his eyes, um, if our eyes were the same size, they'd be the size of grapefruits. Our eyes would be huge. Um, they, those eyes are perfect for seeing in low light conditions. And the other side effect of not having like ball shaped eyes, not having perfectly round eyes is that he actually has no muscles to move his eyes side to side, which is okay for him because that means that he has more room to open his eye. His iris is really, really wide, but that means that he has to be able to turn his head really, really far around in order to um, see, what's see what's around in order to see what's coming for him. So we can move our heads about shoulder to shoulder or about 207, no, wait, we can do about 180 degrees. We can do about half of a circle, okay? He can do about 270 degrees around, which he's just about doing right now. That's about shoulder to shoulder and then the ability to look straight backwards without turning your back. Now, he does that so that he can look all the way around him and still not move. Again, that camouflage, even though he's top of the food chain, when he gets older, he'll have things that are starting to attack him, like um, uh, red-tailed hawks might try to attack him while he's resting during the day. Um, so his camouflage is still useful for that. So he's able to turn around without breaking the body camouflage, without moving his body. Okay. He's also able to hear and see all the way around and make sure that if there is any food there, he knows where it is. Okay. Um, what else? They are called great horned owls because they do have little two horns on the top of their head. Those are just feathers. They're not his ears. They don't actually have any sort of apparatus in there whatsoever. They're literally just feathers sticking up. Um, they use them mostly for communication. So if they see something, they might put their ear, put their little ear tufts up as a warning or as an interest, sign of interest. 
Um, but that is mostly communication for these guys. They might also use it to break up their silhouette and hide in the trees a little bit better. Um, if horizontal lines are really not a thing in nature too much, so especially on a tree, more vertical lines. So those plumicorns, which is what they're called, the plumicorns, those ear tufts are going to sit up and they are going to break up his silhouette just enough so that you don't just see the flat line on the top of his head. Okay, so they're going to make it a little bit harder for him to be seen. Yeah. They are very, very fluffy. Believe it or not, most of their body is feathers, and that's so that they can fly silently. Their feathers are very, very soft, and I'll show you something real quick when we get done with him. And their feathers are very, very soft, and they are um, they're fluffy in that they break up the wind currents. So they are, he's able to fly very, very quietly because he's able to break up all the wind currents. If you've ever heard like a duck or a goose try and take off, they are, they're so loud. It's almost like a gunshot going off. These guys take off so quietly you can't hear them. Okay. And all of that is because the air just sort of passes right through them as if they're a ghost. Um, yeah, I'm gonna put you away. Can I have your attention, please? Because if your attention's over there, that means you're gonna try and go away. It's kind of scary when he's looking right at you. Okay, all right. I am gonna put him away. Oh, did I mention that his name is Houdini? His name is Houdini because he has tried to escape several times. Um, right about now, this time of year too, you probably see and hear these guys a lot outside in your area. These guys are just starting to set up their nesting territory, late October, early um, November. They're starting to set up their nesting, uh, their, their nesting grounds, their territory. Owls are very territorial. So you'll hear them calling, calling to their mate and calling to warn other owls not to come near them. Okay, Just stay away, you know. Uh, they like to nest in old red tail nests. They don't generally make their own nests. So you'll see them hanging out where red tails used to be. They will mate and lay their eggs sometime in January, February. They start very early for our birds. So they start very early. They will, hey, you're okay. I'm going to fly again. Well, if you stop trying to jump away, you would be fine. He's probably not too fond of all the lights, too. I wouldn't say they hurt his eyes, but it's uncomfortable, especially after just being in a nice dark box that he likes. Um, so yeah, a lot of these guys are starting to set up their territory right about now. So they're going to be active. You're going to hear them hooing. They have, um, the great horned owls have that classic hoo 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 call. Mm. I'm sorry, did I offend you? I think I did. So he is, you're going to hear them calling to their mates, calling to other owls, saying, stay out of my territory. January and February is when they lay their eggs. March and April is when those eggs hatch and they start to, actually March is when the eggs hatch usually. And then they're going to start to feed them. The babies get to full size within about two months. So they get to be full size very, very quickly. Um, and then they start to fly or try to fly and that's when we get baby owls coming in happens okay but these guys do need to be taught how to hunt they do need to be taught what is appropriate food for them and in this case they're going to try and go after the skunks because the skunks are big easy meals which is fantastic for them um, one big skunk can feed them for a while they don't necessarily eat every day but they certainly try these guys, they might try and hunt um, every day just so they can keep their strength up. Um, but they can go a day or two without eating too, okay? They'll be all right. All right, you're panting, so I will put you back in. That panting means that he's a little nervous, that's all. Okay. Sometimes he's hot, but today I don't think it's because he's hot. You're gonna go back in, you're all right. Okay. Ready? Oh, 
Oh, I know. Good boy. Good boy. All right. Like I said, working with animals, you have to be able to adapt to what they'll let you do, which is not much usually. You have to respect them. So I said I wanted to show you, this is um, the wing of a barred owl, okay? Now, our not all of the animals that come into our hospital are, are savable. They're, sometimes their injury is just too much. So we do um, have a license to keep some of them, keep parts of them so that we can use them for education purposes only. Okay. So I wanted to show you this. If you are aware that owls actually have kind of like a ridge going up and down. So that is, um, it almost looks like eyelashes running right along the side of their wing. And that actually breaks up the air currents and that helps them fly much, much faster than, or I'm sorry, much quieter. It breaks up the air currents as, it going, as it's going up and over the wing. Um, lots and lots of little air currents are much quieter than one big air current, like something like a red-tailed hawk, okay? They've got a very smooth wing going right there. They're very fast, but not very quiet, all right? Now, with that, all of these animals are at Woodford Cedar Run Wildlife Refuge. Um, Houdini, I believe the owl is the only one who is off display at the moment. Um, you can see Phoebe, our skunk, and Chevy, our, friend, oh, I'm sorry, our corn snake at the nature, uh, you can see the corn snake at the nature center. You can see Phoebe in the wildlife housing area. So we do have a bunch of animals on display. You can come and visit. Um, we are open to the public. We are open 10 to 4 on the weekdays, 10 to 3 on the weekends, but you can come and pay your admission and then just kind of wander around for a little while longer. We do have a couple miles of hiking trails you can wander around on, and we do also things like birthday parties, scout programs, all sorts of things. So if you're interested, give us a call, look us up online, and thank you very, very much for um, having me out today. And I think we're going to go back to um, doing the questions. So if anybody has any questions, I love them. I always forget to forget to do stuff. Rachel, thank you very much. That was a fantastic program. I really enjoyed seeing the the critters live in person. And uh, what a what a wonderful uh, list of facts that you you told us about all of them. So I really appreciate the program. And I want to thank you for hanging in. We did have some technical difficulties, and mm -hmm. you were a constant professional. And uh, you did a great presentation. I'm Wonderful. going to put. I'm going to share my screen now. So with the phone number, and if anybody has any questions for Rachel, uh, please feel free to call in, and uh, I'll put that up right now. The phone number and the ID number. Love the questions. Call in, please, because <laughs> I always forget to say something. I don't know if the questions are coming up. Okay. Okay, here comes the uh, number. Please feel free to dial in and uh, we'll uh, have your question live on the air. Cool. Okay. Okay. Here's the number. Hopefully, uh, some folks call in. Uh, as I said before, Rachel, great job. I really enjoyed uh, 
all, all three animals, the, the corn snake, the skunk, and uh, definitely that great horned owl. Um, he was pretty calm. <laughs> he's been better, but <laughs> he's a character. I've, I've used him for a couple days this week, so he's, I wouldn't say he's annoyed, but he would much rather be back in his enclosure, so. It, like I said, it's really difficult working with animals sometimes just because they don't always cooperate like you want them to. Yep, you never, uh, you never know what you got. I didn't think if I forgot anything with any of my animals, if there's anything I wanted to mention. Hmm. Okay. Oh, here we go. Having some problems with the screen share, actually. It's not showing. Oh, okay. All right. Yep. Uh, this is one of those days where the animals certainly did a good job, but the uh, technology has kind of left us hanging a couple times. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Okay, let's see, we're, it's uh, slowly coming. We'll see if it can uh, open up for us here. All right. I wish I could see the YouTube comments, see if there's any questions in there. Uh, we, we generally shut the YouTube comments off just to keep, that's a way to keep someone from saying something inappropriately that we don't want out there. Um, but yeah. the questions are up right yeah. now. Uh, the number is 1-929-205-6099. And uh, the meeting ID uh, is there as well. And um, that meeting ID is 822-1647-2381. Uh, so uh, we'll hold just for a little bit to make sure there's no one trying to call. And uh, if you do call, Paul, we'll be glad to uh, bring you in and uh, answer your questions. Mm -hmm. I can't wait. People usually have great questions. And yet, uh, last week we had some folks call in from uh, Brooklyn, New York. They were wanted to know about hiking the Batona Trail. Uh, oh. So we had a pretty wide ranging audience for sure. That's great. Yep. We've had a number of calls from completely out of the pine. Hey, that's awesome. Yep. The reach is great. You know, and the, the really interesting thing about these videos is uh, even if the people don't see them live, they can come back and watch them whenever they're free. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've really been seeing the numbers climb uh, in the, you know, the days and weeks after each of the presentations. Mm -hmm. um, it's been difficult doing education programs because, you know, in-person programs for the most part have kind of ceased during COVID, but uh, we've been lucky yeah. to find through this uh, virtual yeah. platform that we are probably reaching more people than we were reaching, uh, you know, in the, in the normal every day uh, before uh, COVID came about. It's certainly a wider audience. You know, we've had a couple of programs where we've had people call in or video in from California even. So yeah, it's, it's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different world than just, you know, local little school groups coming in. Yeah, you, you know, you, you underestimate how wide reaching your, 
there are ranges sometimes. And uh, that, that's definitely been the case the last uh, six or so months. Mm -hmm. It's also kind of nerve wracking too, because now you're out there for the entire world to see. <laughs> so you really have to be on the well, ball and really yep, have to get a good program going. Yep, that, that's definitely been a concern because yeah, once it's out there, it's out there. So uh, we've certainly kept that in mind with uh, you know the programs we've tr picked and tried. And uh, I, I said again, you did a great job today. So we, uh, no problems on your end. You really uh, covered some good material and uh, we appreciate the, uh, the program. All right, well, I think probably no one's gonna call in at this point, so. I guess that means it's a good time to wrap up. Uh, as I said, Rachel, thank you very much. I apologize for the little delay we had there, but uh, you were a true professional and the animals did a great job as well. So thank you very much. That's all right. Thank you so much for having us. And if you guys have any questions later, um, you can email Cedar Run directly. You can email us at education at cedarrun.org um, or you can um, contact Joel and he can send things over to us if you need to. Yep, that would absolutely work. Uh, you could contact the commission. Our email address is uh, in info at pinelands.nj.gov. And I would gladly forward any questions to uh, Rachel over there at Cedar Run. And uh, if you got some free time and you're looking for a place to visit, Cedar Run's right there in Medford. And it's a great, great time to go out and see the animals and check out all those Pinelands habitats they have that are surrounded by the uh, refuge there. Yeah, it's a really cool place. So hope to see you soon. And thank you guys very much for having us out or in, I guess. <laughs> yep. All right. I'm going to shut down the live stream.